How many of you like comparing things? Anybody? How many of you like comparing yourself to other things? All right, hands go down. That's not true. We do this all the time, right? Most of y'all will leave here today and you will pick this thing up and you will go to Instagram or Facebook or TikTok. Anybody still use MySpace? Anybody? All right, no, no MySpace. But you will just scroll through and you will spend hours comparing. You'll be like, oh, oh, man, I wish I looked like that person. Oh, I'm glad I don't look like that person. Oh, oh, man, I wish I had that car. Oh, that's a nice house. I wonder why my house is so small. I need a bigger house. Y'all know what? I need a bigger house now. Oh, that's a cute dog. I wish my dog acted like that. My dog just runs amok and sheds everywhere. Like, I don't know. But we do this thing of comparison all the time. It's a part of our, our everyday lives. And because we compare so much, many of us spend our time living discontent. We found ourselves in this place where we're just not happy with anything we have. We're not satisfied with the things that God has blessed us with. We live in a constant state of being discontent. And so we're going to talk today about how can you and me find contentment in this world of comparison. Now, just so we're all speaking the same language, I'm going to give you my definition of comparison. It's this. It's a consideration or estimate of the similarities or dissimilarities between two things or people. So we're talking about similarities or dissimilarities here, and we do this a lot. We will, we will constantly compare ourselves to other things. For some of us, we do this in a way of, in a religious way. We will compare ourselves to the way that other people live. You know what, God, I'm a good person because I don't live like this person over here. I don't drink as much as they do. I don't smoke as much as they do. I don't cuss as much as they do. So, Lord, I'm okay. Some of us look at people and we do the opposite. Lord, they're way better than me. I can never live up to that standard. How could you ever even love me, God, because I'm just such a horrible person? And we use this thing of comparison. And what we really miss in all of that is we miss the person that God has created us to be. We miss the person that God has designed us to be. So I want to help you today Learn how to be content with who you are in Christ in the midst of a world of comparison. Now, I'm going to start with, and y'all forgive me, I, don't, I, did, I wasn't very smart yesterday. I went to watch ODU play football last night. I don't know that they really play football, but I went to watch ODU play football, and, and I wore a hoodie, and it was like 40 degrees outside, and so I'm a little congested today. I'm a little messed up, so y'all forgive me for that. But I want to start today by giving you a story from Scripture that I believe kind of illustrates this idea of comparison. It kind of gives us a biblical model for what we can do in comparison. I don't know if you're familiar with this man in Scripture named Peter. Peter was one of the apostles who followed Jesus. He was one of Jesus' 12 disciples. He was one of Jesus' best friends. When Jesus went out and picked his disciples, he picked 12 guys. We know that one of them eventually betrayed him, Judas Iscariot. But there was three guys that Jesus was particularly close to. Peter, a man named John, and his brother James. They were like Jesus' right-hand guys. In fact, Peter was the one who told Jesus, Lord, I will go wherever you go. If they throw you in prison, I'm there. If they kill you, I'm there, Jesus. Wherever you go, wherever you find yourself, Jesus, I'm going to be right there with you. Well, we know on the night that Jesus was betrayed that, that Peter actually denied Jesus that he saw Jesus get arrested. And Peter decided, like, you know what, Lord, I know I said I would die with you, but I didn't really mean that. I'm just going to take a step back because now you're going somewhere that I don't really want to go. I had hope that you were going to be the Messiah, that you were going to set us free from this Roman occupation, but now you're being handed over to the authorities, and this isn't really what I signed up for. This was Peter. Peter went from ride or die to running away in two seconds flat. And so Peter, after Jesus rises from the grave, Peter and the other disciples get to see Jesus a few times. And one of these encounters, they're all out on a boat and they're fishing. And, and Jesus, one of them looks on the shore and they says, that's the master there. So Peter takes off his outer garment and he dives into the sea and he swims to the shore and he gets to Jesus. And him and Jesus have this conversation. You can find it in the book of John chapter 21. But Jesus says to Peter, Peter, do you love me more than these? And Peter responds, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus asked him another time, Peter, do you love me more than these? Peter says, Lord, you know I love you. So Jesus tells him to tend his lambs. Jesus asked Peter a third time. And a lot of scholars believe that Jesus did that because Peter denied him three times. So Jesus asked him this question three times as a means of restoring him. Jesus says, Peter, do you love me more than these? And Peter says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus says, then feed my sheep. 
And so Jesus and Peter, they continue walking along the beach. And as they are walking along the beach, Jesus says to Peter, Peter, one day someone is going to take you where you do not want to go. Someone is going to drag you where you do not want to be taken, and they are going to clothe you. Jesus was giving Peter a picture of how Peter was going to die. He's basically saying that at some point in your life, Peter, that these authorities, they're going to come and they're going to grab you. They're going to take you away. And we know through church history that Peter was actually crucified upside down. He was crucified just like Jesus, but upside down. But in this moment, Jesus is telling Peter that this day is going to come where you're going to be taken somewhere you don't want to go. And as they're having this conversation and they are walking along, Peter does what I think many of us would do in that moment. He turns around and he looks and he sees John walking behind them. And in this moment, Peter has a moment of comparison. And this is where we're going to pick up at in verse 20. It says that Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, that's how John refers to himself in this gospel, that he's the disciple whom Jesus loved. He says that Peter turned and saw John walking, and the one who also leaned back against him during supper. This is John. So if you see that Leonardo da Vinci painting of the Last Supper, there's this one guy that's leaning back against Jesus. In that moment, we read in Scripture, John's actually asking Jesus, who's going to betray you? But we see this in this painting, that John's leaning back against Jesus, and he says to him, Lord, that asks, Lord, who is it that's going to betray you? And it says, when Peter saw him, When Peter saw John, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Now put yourself in Peter's shoes. He just had this moment, this time in his life where he was walking with Jesus and he saw these miracles and life was going really well. And then he betrays Jesus. So he thinks he's no longer worthy to be a disciple of Jesus. In fact, the gospel of Mark, which was written by a man named John Mark, but scholars believe was actually dictated by Peter. It's Peter's telling of what Jesus's life was. On the day of the resurrection, Jesus tells Mary, go tell the disciples and Peter. He didn't even consider himself a disciple anymore. So he had this moment where he is separated from the group, but now Jesus has restored him. And in the midst of this this restoration, as they're walking along the beach, Peter turns around and sees John and says, well, what's going to happen to him? You live your life that way? I can't lie, church. I know that I have. Like, Lord, I'm following you. I'm walking with you. but, But what's happening with this person over here? Why does it feel like I'm struggling? Why does it feel like I'm the only one having a hard time right now? Why does it feel like they're not going through anything, but I'm going through everything? Lord, what about that man? What about him? Lord, why is my marriage struggling? Lord, why are my finances in shambles? Lord, why are my children rebelling? Why? I know those parents. They stink as parents. Why are their kids doing okay? Lord, what about them? It's what we do. But Jesus said to Peter in that moment, if it's my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. And church, I think oftentimes what we miss in this walk with Jesus is that we are called to follow Jesus personally. Our following of Jesus is not about what God does in another person's life. It's not even about where God pulls another person to. You are called to follow Jesus for yourself. You're called to be obedient to him for yourself. And we live in this world of comparison where everything that we look around at says that you need to compare yourself to something else. And we even do this in good things, church, like we do this as churches. I'll go on Instagram today after service and I'll look around and I'll look at other churches and be like, oh man, they got a really big building. Why do we have to meet in a the theater? Oh man, he's got 8,000 people in this crowd. That seems cool. There's 150 of us here today. Why are the crowds different size, Jesus? Like we get into this thing of comparison and the Lord would say to us, why can't you be content with what I've given you? Why can't you be content with what I've entrusted to you? Why can't you just be happy, which is what contentment really stems from, this happiness. Why can't you have joy in the midst of your life with what I've placed in your hands? Why do you feel you always need more? Well, I want to teach you a few things about comparison today because I feel like comparison is this thing that steals our contentment. And the first one you've probably heard, it's this comparison is the thief of joy. Many of us go through life and we're so discontent and we wonder why we have no joy in our life. And it's because 
we spend all our time comparing our lives to other people. Lord, they have all these things that I want. Why can't I have those things? Why can't I look that way? Why can't I be that way? Why can't I have that relationship? Why can't I have this car? Why can't I have this house? And the Lord would say, do you not see what I've already blessed you with? Do you not see the blessings you already have in your life? Do you not see the mere blessing of the fact that you woke up this morning? Do you not see what I've already given you? But comparison comes and it steals your joy. And we go through life wondering why we feel miserable day after day after day. It's because we're so busy comparing ourselves to everyone else. And because we don't have what they have or may not look like they look or, or be as smart as what they are, we feel beat up and cast down and depressed and anxious. And comparison has stolen our joy. It's stolen our joy. Here's something else about comparison. It's the enemy of obedience. And here's what I mean by that. You and I can know that God has called us to do something. Like Scripture tells us all the time that God wants us to be generous. And no, this is not a ploy for me to say give to the church. He wants us to be generous outside of the church. And many times we can go through life and say, you know what? The Lord has actually blessed me enough to be a blessing to somebody else. But because I've been comparing myself to these other people all day, and they have this really big farmhouse. Do y'all like farmhouses? I like farmhouses. I like the way they look. I grew up in the country. I want a farmhouse with a really big wraparound porch and a really big yard where can run around and just be a happy dog. Like, I want that. I want five different bedrooms in my house. Why? Because I'm a glutton for punishment, and I want to make space for my grown kids to come back when they want to. Like, I want this stuff, right? I want this big house. Do you want a big house? I really want a big house, and God's actually given me a pretty decent job, so I'm going to spend all my money saving up for this big house. And what happens is, because I, now I'm not content with the house the Lord has blessed me with, is I start putting all of my resources into getting something that I've seen somebody else with. And now I'm not being generous the way that God has called me to be generous. Because I'm so focused on what other people have. I like cars. I like really nice cars. I don't drive a really nice car. My car is 14 years old or somewhere around there, right? It's a good car. It gets me from point A to B. It's actually a lot of fun to drive. It drives like a go-kart because it's small and I look like a clown because I can barely fit in it. But that's okay, right? <laughs> Y'all laughed a little too much. I'm a little, it's a little disrespectful. But anyway, <laughs> but I go online. And now that I've said car out loud, y'all know how these things work. I'm going to go on Facebook, and it's going to be Audi, BMW, Mercedes, like straight down the line. It's going to be all of them. And then I'm going to be on, on, <laughs> on the payment calculator, like, all right, Lord, how much of a payment can I afford? And the Lord's like, none, bro. You're a church planner. Anyway, right? <laughs> and we do this thing where we get so discontent, where it's like, man, I have this car that's paid off, and it runs great, and it's not causing me any issues. But I'm discontent with it because this person online has a nicer car than me. And so now I'm going to start stressing myself out trying to get what they have. And I'm going to stress my finances out trying to get what they have. And, and I'm going to stress my credit out trying to get what they have. Like, and then I'll walk around anxious and I wonder why I can't be generous the way God's called me to be generous when he's already blessed me with something, but I'm discontent with it. Because I'm constantly comparing what I have to what somebody else has. Instead of just being happy for the fact that that person has it. The flip side of that is that we have to realize is that what we see on social media oftentimes is what people want you to see. Because you may see that really nice car and you're like, man, I want that. But what you don't see is that now that brother's working 95 hours a week to pay that $1,300 a month car payment. And so his family's falling apart, his health is falling apart, like he's pouring everything he has into that. And all you see is the car. And you're like, I want that. But you don't see all the things that come along with it. Some of you are parents, and you're like, man, I wish my kids behaved like their kids. You see that? They got five kids, and they're so well-behaved. They're on vacation. They all look happy. My wife and I have five, have five kids. Let me tell you something. Five kids on vacation, nobody's happy. <laughs> Everybody's upset, right? Because we've been in this car for 13 hours trying to get to the happiest place on earth to be outside in 120 degree weather on the concrete at Disney World and now everybody's miserable and the nine-year-old that promised me he was going to walk the whole time is asking me to pick him up. And we're all, preach, you don't even got kids, man. Like, <laughs> And nobody's happy. But what you see on Facebook is 
Mom and dad have said, look, we're about to take this picture so your grandma thinks you're happy, so everybody better smile for this two seconds. Let me get this picture on whooping everybody. And so they're like smiling. The kids are like. <laughs> and you see that and you're like, man, they're so happy. Why can't we be happy? They're not happy. <laughs> they just got threatened. And that's okay. Sometimes you got to do that. Anyway, you see, you see what people want you to see, right? It steals your joy. You see the people who get up and like, hey, guys, I just woke up, and they take this picture, and you're like, there's no way you just woke up. There's not a hair out of place. Your makeup is perfectly done. Like, there's like, you got makeup all over you, but there's none on the pillow. Like, you did not sleep this way. But it's what they want you to see. And so we soak that stuff up, and we're like, man, I really wish I'd looked like that person. I really wish I had that car. I really wish my kids behaved that way. And we're so discontent with what we have. We're so discontent with what God has given us that we begin to get a little upset with God about it. Comparison will steal your joy, and comparison will lead you to a place of disobedience. Because God has called you to be light in the midst of darkness. He's called you to be generous. He's called you to be kind. He's called you to be gentle. He's called these things to be stirred up inside of you. But comparison will lead you to a place where all of your focus is on you. Hear me clearly in this. Comparison will always lead to discontent. Comparison will always lead to discontent. And the reason that comparison will always lead to discontent is this. Anybody, I brought my mirror with me today. I just want to make sure I look right since I'm on camera. Let me get my microphone straight. And, yeah. All right, I'm good, right? We're good, good to go. All right. What we do is we go through life in comparison, and, and we take out our phones, and we kind of look at what the world has, like, oh, okay, yeah. Oh, man, she looks pretty good. Do I look that way? Oh, no. My hairline's receding. I need to do like LeBron James and get me a new hairline. Let me pull this back to the front. Right? And, we, and, so, and so we go through life that way. We see this person online. Oh, man, I wish my body looked like that. So, oh, uh-oh. I put my shirt on this morning. I was like, this thing feel a little extra tight. I wonder if it shrunk. It didn't. I grew. But now I'm jealous. And so I'm constantly in the mirror, and I'm constantly focused on me trying to pick out everything that's wrong with me and trying to compare myself to this standard that I was never meant to be compared to, and I wonder why I'm miserable in who I am, and I wonder why I'm miserable with my life, and it's because I've got all my, all of my attention is either focused on who they are and who I'm not, or who I am and who they're not. And this is where all of my attention goes. And we wonder why we live in a world as followers of Christ and we can't see the lost and the broken and the hurting. Let me ask you a question. How well would you be able to pay attention to the people around you if you're constantly going through life like this? I'm in front of this room. I can't see any of y'all right now. And the problem is, church, the problem is, and hear me clearly on this young people especially, the problem is, is that you are comparing yourself to a false narrative. And you're trying to live up to a false standard. You're comparing yourself to a false narrative about beauty. You're comparing yourself to a false narrative about success. You're comparing yourself to a false narrative about the things you should hope in. And you're trying to live up to a standard you were never created to live up to. If you really want to look at yourself in a mirror, this is the mirror you need to look in. Because this is the only mirror that will ever give you a proper perspective of who you are. This mirror cannot tell you who or how you were created in your mother's womb, but this mirror will tell you that you were perfectly knit together in your mother's womb. That you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And the problem is, is that we try to go through life looking in these other places for the answers that we need instead of going to God's word. And we find ourselves being molded into what the world has said we should be. And we wonder why each and every day we look less and less and less like Jesus. And each and every day we're stressed out more and more and more trying to look like the world that we were not created to look like. 
And so you have young people altering their bodies because they're trying to live up to a certain standard. You have older people pouring all of their resources into, I just have to look a little bit more young, younger. I have to look a little bit nicer. You're 85,000 years old. You're not going to look younger. It's okay, right? Like I 40, I'm 47. I know there's no going back. There's no point in me looking at 25-year-old. Like at that football game last night, I'm like, these guys are running down the field and they got muscles rippling everywhere. And I'm like, bro, I'm 47. I'm hurt just sitting on these bleachers. Like there's no point in me trying to be like them. If I went down on that field right now and got tackled one time, they would have to call an ambulance. Like there's no point in me trying to be them, right? Those kids, are, they're 20. They don't feel any pain right now. <laughs> some, some of y'all, some. But, but what we do is we end up in situations like that and we spend our whole time comparing. And we become so discontent with who we are. Now, I'm not saying, like, hear me clearly on this. Like, if, if you want to live a healthier life, go for it. If you want to get in better shape, although round is a shape, but if you want to get in better shape, Go for it. Just make sure you're doing it for the right reasons. Make sure you're trying to live healthier because you understand that your body is the temple of God and you need to take care of it. Not because you're trying to look like somebody you saw online. Make sure you're doing these things. Make sure you're trying to be healthier so that you can take better care of your family and, and be a better contributor to the people that God has placed in your life. Not because you're trying to live up to some false narrative, some false standard that somebody else has set for you, because you will always be discontent in that. Hear me clearly on this. There's never enough makeup for you to put on. There's never enough clothes for you to buy. You can't lift enough weights to make you satisfied based on what the world standard says you should be. You'll never be satisfied in it. You will always find yourself wanting more. You will always find yourself feeling like you need to do more. You just have to have more. And that's why so many people right now are broken, depressed, and anxious because we spend all our lives just trying to get to a place to fill a void that was never designed to be filled by anything but Jesus himself. And we're trying to fill that void with the appreciation and the affection of other people. We're trying to fill that void with possessions and things in our own life. And we wonder why we walk around still feeling empty. It's because we have a God-sized void that we're trying to fill with man-sized things, and we still feel empty on the inside. And that comparison, that, that thing, that comparison that leads us to that, ploy, that place will always make you feel discontent. But here's what contentment is. Contentment is living the journey that God has for you. Contentment is you living the journey, the specific journey that God has for you. You finding yourself in the middle of God's will for your life, obeying his word in your life, following his son in your life. Living the journey that God has for you. That's contentment. And that's what Jesus meant in verse 22 when he said to him, if it's my will that he remain until I come, what's that to you? You follow me. Contentment is not you trying to be Pastor Jay or somebody else. Contentment is you being who Jesus has called you to be. Now, there are some similarities in that as disciples. Scripture gives us a very clear picture of what a disciple is. And so there will be some similarities between us. But I cannot be you any more than you can be me as a Christ follower. And I need to walk the journey that God has called me to walk. And that may be different for each of us. For some of y'all, he may have called you to be a missionary. He's called me to be a pastor. Maybe he's called you to do something else. All of those journeys are going to be different. We just need to be obedient in the journey that he called us to. And I use, I use this illustration a lot. I can't sing a lick, y'all. Like, if y'all heard me sing, y'all would run out of here quick. And it would be wrong for me, like Brian, Brian was up here singing, caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm standing over there. I'm singing the same song. We don't sound the same. But if I got mad because Brian can sing and I can't, and I'm like, well, I'm just not going to do anything. I'm not going to do what God's called me to do because I can't do that thing. Then I'm caught in disobedience because of comparison. I'm not using the gifts that God's given me for his glory because of comparison. I'm mad with God because he gave Brian the gift that I want. I, I just want to sing. 
Some of y'all are old enough to remember Monty Python. You'll remember that. The rest of y'all, eh, you'll be all right. But we have to follow Jesus in the path that he's called us to, right? And so that brings up this question. How can we live a content life in a world that breeds comparison? How can you and I just live contently, be content with who we are, find contentment, in the world is just constantly comparing in every area of life. And there's a hint, you need to guard your mind. So if we go to the book of Philippians chapter four, thankful for my son on the production team who fixed the slides, because last service it said Philippians three and I was wrong, but I won't compare myself to people who are right. So <laughs> we'll go to Philippians chapter four, and we're gonna pick up reading in verse four. And if you have your Bible, you can go ahead and turn there. If not, the verse will be on the screen. And if you are in the notes, there's a little hyperlink there for this passage. You can just click and follow along there. This is the Apostle Paul talking to the church in Philippi. He starts this way. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Now, I think it's interesting that Paul is the one saying this, because if you want to talk about comparison for a moment, Paul is writing this while he's in prison. So Paul is chained to a guard at this point in life. And he's saying to rejoice. He's following the path that God has called him to. He's following the path that Jesus has for him. And that path has led him to prison. Now, Paul could have did what Peter did and said, Lord, I'm following you too. Why are they all out there free and I'm stuck here in prison? He didn't do that. He's saying rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. He goes on in verse 6 to say, do not be anxious about anything. He didn't say, you know, don't, don't be anxious about small things. He said, don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, so these are absolute words, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, in everything that you do, by prayer and supplication, so in everything that you face, by prayer, going to the Father, letting him know the needs that you have, asking of him the things that you need from him, and supplication, which just means to plead. So in some forms, in some big situations, Father, I am pleading with you. I need you to come through right now. He says, in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. And I think this is key, because oftentimes what we do is we go to the Lord in prayer with complaining instead of with thanksgiving. Lord, I, I need your help, Jesus. My kids, they just gone off the rails. I don't even know why you gave me these kids anyway. I didn't even really want kids, but you know, my wife, she's cute and I like her, so we had kids. And, and these children that you gave me, Lord, the same children that Scripture tells us that children are a blessing from the Lord, that blessed is the man who has his quiver full of them. That like, like they're like arrows in the hands of a skillful warrior. And instead of going to God with thanksgiving about our kids, we go to God with complaining about our kids. So we may not like their behavior right now. Let me tell you something. Most of your kids act like you. Talk about a mirror. All right. So he says, with thanksgiving, and my kids act like me too. I'm not trying to beat y'all up with that. Somebody said that's what I say when I feel bad, but there you go. Let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So Paul is saying that in everything we face, if I go to the Father and I pray, Lord, this is what I'm facing. I know you already see it because you're my heavenly Father and you care for me and you're om omniscient. You know all things like you already see this. But Lord, this is, what I'm, this is what I'm coming to you with. And the reason that you want me to come to you is because it demonstrates faith. I have faith enough to ask you to intervene on my behalf, and I have faith enough to believe that you're able to do it. That's why prayer and supplication is so important. It's not that God doesn't know or that he doesn't care. He wants you to demonstrate that you have the faith enough to ask and faith enough to believe. That's why he said you don't need big faith. You don't need faith the size of a mountain, just faith the size of a mustard seed, just enough faith to say, Lord, help. Lord, help. He says if you come to him that way, with thanksgiving, you know what, Lord, I feel like my body's failing, and I need your help. 
but I'm thankful that you woke me up this morning. I'm thankful for the life that you've already given me. I'm thankful for the health that you've given me all these years. And even though I find myself in a situation today where I don't feel all that great, I'm thankful that you have blessed me to this point. But I'm asking you to please intervene in my behalf now. Be Jehovah Rapha, the Lord God, my healer. Step in in my place. You're the great physician. I need your help in this moment. And so I go to him. I don't get anxious. I go to him in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, not with, Lord, I can't believe you let this happen to me. I thought you were good, God. How could you do this to me? But that's oftentimes how we go to him. And I get it. Like, things come in life that upset us. They frustrate us. I totally get that. But we need to remember who we're talking to. Solomon, who's considered the wisest man on earth, said in the book of Ecclesiastes that that God is in heaven and we are on earth, so let your words be few. And what he means by that is to have respect, to have reverence for God because God is on the throne. You and I are not. And I don't know why he allows some things to come in our life. I'm not God. I can't explain that to you. But I do know that he said that all things will work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And then he tells us what that good is, that we would be conformed to the image of the Son. So I can tell you, although I don't know why he allowed it, I can tell you that his purpose in it is to conform you to the image of Jesus to conform you to the image of Christ. What Paul tells us here, that if I go to the Father and I pray with thanksgiving and I tell God my request, that God's peace that surpasses all understanding, my problem may not get fixed right away, but he's telling me I will have God's peace that won't even make sense to other people. It will guard my hearts and my mind in Christ Jesus. And then Paul goes on to say, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Let me ask you a question. What do you spend most of your time thinking about? Do you spend most of your time thinking about the problems or do you spend most of your time thinking about the things that are worthy of praise? Because Paul's being very clear here, he's telling us to think about, to focus on, to fix our mind on the things that are true. What's truth? God's word. The things that are pure, what's pure? His word. The things that are are just, who is just? God is just. He's the perfect standard for justice, for righteousness, for holiness. He is what's honorable. He's saying to fix our minds, fix our eyes, fix our hearts back on Jesus, fix our minds back on his word. And if there's anything excellent in it, anything worthy of praise, think about those things. And last week we were in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 where he told him, he's like, don't despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good and abstain from every form of evil. He's saying to fix your mind, your eyes, your thoughts, your body on these things that are from God and that are good. But oftentimes what we do is we run back to this and we fix our minds on everything but this. And please don't hear this as me railing against social media and all that stuff. I'm really not like I think there's a lot of good we can do with those things when we use them rightly. But I also know that there's a lot of damage that's done by those things when we use them wrongly. Right. So I'm not complaining or, or, or going against it. What I am saying is that you need to measure the influence that things have in your life. And if your greatest source of influence comes from anything other than God's word, then you're looking to the wrong source. Paul goes on to say in verse 9, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Here's what contentment is. Contentment comes from believing in Christ knowing who you are in him, obeying his word, and following where his spirit leads. And I know that seems like a lot, but it's really just a few quick steps. Number one, do you believe in Jesus? If so, that's your first step to contentment. Do you know who you are in him? Do you know what his word says about you? Not what this says about you. Not what the mirror says, not what the phone says but what his word says about you. Do you know who you are in Christ? 
that you are a joint heir with him, that you're the head and not the tail, that you are more than a conqueror through him who loved you and gave himself for you. Do you know that? And this isn't all about platitudes and affirmations to make you feel good about yourself because this same word tells me that apart from Jesus, I'm wretched, like my heart is wicked, that I was dead in my sin and I was on my way to hell, separated from his grace, and I needed him. Do you know that about yourself? That you need him desperately in your life. Are you obeying his word? Are you living in obedience to him? And are you following where his spirit leads? Or are you following where culture will take you? If you find yourself stuck in comparison, I want you to do three things for me. Remember, repent, and refocus. Remember, repent, and refocus. And we're going to look at Psalm 73. I'm going to read a portion of it to you to tell you what I mean by remember, repent, and refocus. Psalm 73 is a psalm written by a man named Asaph. Asaph is only mentioned a few times in Scripture. He was one of the chief musicians at the, at the temple of God. His job was to lead the people in worship through music of God at the temple. And Psalm 73 starts this way. He says, Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, he's talking about himself here, as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. He's saying that as for him personally, something came up and, and kind of tripped him up a little bit. Like he realized that God was good to Israel, but something came along and tripped Asaph up a little bit. And then he tells us in verse 3 what it is. He says, for I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. So he's saying like, I know God's good to Israel, but I'm looking out here and I see these wicked people prospering. Like, I'm on, I'm on Facebook, Lord, and, and it looks like everyone that's doing everything wrongly is prospering right now. And he said that tripped him up a little bit. For they have no pangs until death. They're, like, they're not going through anything. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They got plenty to eat and they're dressed well. They're not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Apparently, these people were really fat because he's brought that up twice. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily, they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against heaven and their tongue struts through the earth. And y'all, I'm telling you, like, I understand where ASAP is coming from. Because I look at the world around us and I hear how people, it's like Romans chapter 1 is playing itself out like people have exalted themselves against the knowledge of God. And so God has turned them over to a debased mind and they are doing things that are impure and immoral and, and doing things with their bodies that they should not be doing. And it looks from the sideline like, hey, some of these people are prospering, God. But they're wicked and they're totally against you and they're prospering, Lord, and I don't understand it. And this is where Asaph is in this moment. He says, therefore, his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? They're questioning God. Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. All in vain have I kept my heart clean. So now he's looking at himself. He's like, I have been working really hard to remain righteous. But Lord, I feel like it's in vain. Because my perspective in, is in this moment that the wicked are prospering and I'm suffering. He's like, I've done this all in vain. For all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I have said I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. But then he has a moment of, of refocus, if you will. He says, but when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. So he has this moment where he has to remember. And the way that he remembers is he steps back into God's sanctuary. See, his perspective was wrong. He was using these wrong tools to look at life. And because he was using the wrong tools to look at life, he was thinking about how the wicked were prospering and how he and the other righteous were struggling. But he had to step back into the sanctuary of God. He said, then I discerned their end. Truly, you set them in slippery places. You make them fall into ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors, like a dream when one awakes. Oh, Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. 
When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you, God. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. So he's remembering now that he is walking with the Lord. Lord, you hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. You cover my head. And afterward, you will receive me to glory. I know where I am destined to go. And then there's this verse 25 that will be on the screen for you, because this is what I want you to focus and meditate on for a moment. He says, whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. Whom have I in heaven but you, Lord? And there's nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Is that your cry this morning? God, you are the strength of my heart and my portion forever. He says in verse 27, For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. And that's what's going to happen in this world, church, that unfortunately there's going to come a day where everyone who's unfaithful to God, an end will be put to them according to what God's word says. But we as the righteous, we as those who follow Jesus know that one day we will reign with him in victory and in glory. And we don't look down on the unfaithful. We actually pity the unfaithful because we know where the end leads. Then Asaph closes it out in verse 28 when he says, but for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. Whom have I in heaven but you, Lord? And my question for you today, church, is this, and this is what I think Asaph, the conclusion he had to come to is, is Jesus enough? Is Jesus in your life enough for you? Or are you constantly comparing yourself to other things and that comparison leading you to a place of discontent? Or are you content and just in Jesus alone? Because let me tell you something about the things. They can be here today and gone tomorrow. And if that is what you derive your contentment from, if your contentment comes from the house you have and the car you have and the job you have and your bank account and, and how well your family's constructed, if your contentment comes from all of those things, every single one of those things can be here today and gone tomorrow, would you still be content in Christ alone? Whom have I in heaven but you? There's nothing on earth my heart desires beside you. My heart and my flesh may fail, but God, you are the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Is that your prayer today? So I have some reflection questions for you. And they are, the first one is, am I stuck in a pattern of comparison? And I want you to be real with yourself. Am I stuck in a pattern of comparison? Am I constantly comparing myself to other people and looking at what they have and I don't have or looking at them like the Pharisees and saying, you know what, I'm better than they are. I see what they're doing. Am I stuck in a pattern of comparison? And then what steps can I take to break that pattern? For some of you, maybe the step you need to take is that you just need to put this down for a little while. You need to put your phone down and you need to pick your Bible up. And you need to start to see yourself through God's eyes and stop comparing yourself to the world's standard. And you're like, man, Pastor Jay, my phone is on my Bible. Like, if you need a paper Bible, if that's going to help you put that other thing down for a minute, we will give you a paper Bible. We have some in the lobby. Well, maybe that's what you need, just to remember, repent, and refocus, to refocus your mind. And then do I believe in Christ, know who I am in him, obey his word, and follow his spirit? And I'm not asking if you do those things perfectly, but I'm asking you, are you, are you trying to do those things in your life? And then we have a Sunday recap. Each week, I like to give you guys something to focus on throughout the week. And our recap for this week is I want you to read Psalm 73 and meditate on it each day this week and ask the Lord to reveal to you times where you're like Asaph, times where maybe you looked at the wicked and saw some prosperity and, and your feet began to slip a little bit. And you're like, man, I want what they have, not realizing that the end of that is destruction, but you've been, you've been called and saved for something much greater. Then ask him to remind you of his presence in those moments and to help you see him as the strength of your heart and your portion. And I believe that if we commit to do this, church, we will begin to see ourselves a little more properly through the lens of his word. And we'll begin to see others around us. And we can put down these other tools that distract us from seeing the lost and the broken and the hurting. And we can begin to see people where they are through the eyes and through the lenses of Jesus and his word. And that's my prayer for us. So would you bow your heads and pray with me today? 
Heavenly Father, I thank you.